A big and warm hello. It's great to have you here. This is episode 33 of Hear Her Sports. I'm your host, Elizabeth Emery. Today's guest is Noelle Singleton. She taught herself to swim by watching the Olympics, now coaches and is the founder of Afro Swimmers, working to eliminate stereotypes while connecting to the Afro swim community all across the world. This is a jam-packed episode. Noelle is a great storyteller. She talks about the aims of Afro Swimmers, passion for her business, meeting swimmers from all around the world, coaching, being an entrepreneur, water, having the strength to pack her bags, representation of all races in media, and living her best life through meal prep and eight hours of sleep. I just feel really lucky to have learned about Noelle. I don't remember how that happened. She's such a strong, focused female voice speaking up about what she believes in. I admire her and hope all of us will speak up even louder than we are now. She has big goals, so stay tuned via her social media, her website, afroswimmers.com, and of course, the Afro Swimmers hashtag. Find those links in the episode notes of hearhersports.com. I'm so happy to introduce Noelle, so let's get to it. Welcome, Noelle, and thank you for being on the show, and a huge congratulations for all your success with Afro Swimmers hashtag. It's totally exploded. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here. And I'm really excited that we were able to connect. Yeah, me too. What What are your numbers today? Your numbers of posts, for example, and I, I definitely know that you're keeping track of all that. Oh, you know, I'm keeping track of it. I actually, um, I remember when I first started the hashtag, I used to check Af- hashtag Afro Summers every hour. I couldn't help it. And then also when you have a business account with Instagram, it allows you to monitor the demographics. So I could see where in the world most of my followers were coming from. And I would love to see the countries change. I remember Russia popped up and I was like, you got to be kidding me, (laughs) Russia. First of all, I didn't know there was black people in Russia. Let's just acknowledge that. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I've seen China up there. I've seen India. I mean, I... And I was like, does China even have Instagram? Because I thought they had all that blocked off. I wasn't even sure what was happening, but I was seeing these amazing countries pop up. But as of today, the Afro Swimmers page has 584 posts. And these are posts that I have, I have personally uh, added. Uh, we have 2,064 followers. And the hashtag, which is the most important piece of it all, today has 3,150 posts. That's great. That's so great. Can you give people who don't know the Afro Swimmers hashtag just, you know, like a, what, what are we talking about here? Gotcha. Um, so Afro Swimmers is a movement to diversify aquatics through images. Images are extremely powerful. And as a swim coach, when I first got onto social media to promote my lessons business, I noticed that there was no black swimmers community. There was very random hashtags and they all had outdated posts on them. Some of the posts were from two or three years ago. Nothing current, nothing fluid, nothing, nothing presently growing or moving. And did so that, sorry to interrupt, but did that blow your mind? Not only did it blow my mind, it upset me. Sure. Because I've been swimming my whole life and social media is rather new. Facebook came out when I was in college. So I got to watch the times change as a millennial. And um, I was definitely concerned and bothered. And all it did was validate my passion even more because it proved my point that there's no platform for us to voice our concerns or talk about you know, skincare or hair care, or this swimsuit worked for me. Uh, I met this coach who really helped me get over my phobia. There was no place, no common safe place for both men and women to meet. And so originally Afro swimmers started off as love swim coaching, which is my for-profit swim lessons business. And I'll explain to you how I got into that later on. But I started off as love swim coaching and I noticed that the the feedback that I was getting, I was getting more questions about my skin and my hair than I was about swimming. Now the swim care questions would come later, but initially it was, Oh my God, look at all that hair she has. How do you do what you do? And so when I created Afro swimmers, I converted love swim coaching into Afro swimmers. 
And Afro Swimmers initially just started off as, you know, it was actually a, a kind of just like a, a um, it was just a hashtag. It was just, you know, something fun. You know how people, cre- you can create any hashtag you want. It wasn't meant to be anything initially. And then I kept using it. And then I started getting feedback. And then the people started sharing. And now hashtag Afro Swimmers is a global movement. It is a, it is a international uh, shared hashtag for men and women of all textures, of all colors, all over the world who can share the amazing things that they're doing in the water. And it's perfect because when some, when you hear somebody share the stereotype or the generalization that black people don't swim, you don't even have to argue with them anymore. All you have to do is say, have you seen, have have you clicked on hashtag Afro swimmers? And when they say no, all you have to do is just pull it up and they make and see for themselves. There's no, there's no debate. There is no, well, I don't know these people or, well, these people aren't here. These people are from everywhere. I have posts that update every single day and it's absolutely amazing. I've got black triathletes. I have divers. I have people who are doing sea walking, you know, open water swimming, um, water polo. I mean, it, the list goes on and on and on. Black surfers, both men and women, just exposing the excellence and the diversity that water truly creates. And it's sad because there's major swim accounts. You know, we have Speedo, we have Finnis, we have Arena. We have these large swim companies that are known for dominating um, the, the sport of swimming and providing great equipment and training, but they don't promote the true people that are participating in this sport. And that's a problem for me. And so Afro swimmers is where we celebrate diversity. It is intentional. We educate and we celebrate each other's accomplishments, whether you just participated in your first meet or you broke a national record. We are here to support you and to celebrate you. And I'm getting so much feedback and it it's a true blessing. I, I don't even have anything else to say about it. It's just absolutely amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's really great. And, you know, one of the things that I noticed right away was I just love how you include all water sports and not just swimming. You know, like, as you said, it's, you know, lifeguarding, surfing, sailing, rowing, you know, diving. I think that's so important just to showcase the range of opportunities. Exactly. Swimming in itself is diverse. Swimming is diversity. There's so many opportunities and doors that open up just from having peace in the water. Swimming, swimming is healing. You know, for me, when I first, I've always been a good swimmer. I've been swimming since I was two years old. Um, I swam competitively as a kid. I actually ended up going to college on a soccer scholarship. I did not swim competitively in college, but I taught swimming. And where I realized I had a gift was when I was able to work with people who have not been able to learn from other attempts. I have an extreme amount of patience when it comes to someone who has discomfort in the water. And for a lot of black people who grew up in black communities or or who are raised by black parents, um, there's a large number of them who have phobias of the water, not because they themselves feared it, but because their parents feared it. Think about it. If your mother could not swim, is she going to take you to the pool where she cannot help you or save you if you're in a compromised situation? Right. No way. No, she's not. She's not going to expose you to any of those sports. So that means when you go to college or you go to school, you're automatically eliminated from anything that has to do with water. That's strike one. Then think about all the amazing vacations that people take as a family or when people go on their own journeys. Most of those places involve water. You can scratch out any water activities, no snorkeling, no kayaking, no, no great barrier reef. You know, you're eliminating all of these key factors that promote healing, relaxation, peace of mind, development. They even have something called float therapy now. You can black out the goggles and they have these little float pods where people, it's a salt water tank and the lid closes and the water turns colors and they play music and it helps you to relax. People need to experience that and your race or your ethnicity should not eliminate you from having access to something as natural and as God given as water itself. And um, 
one of the cool things, have you seen the, the brand mark for Afro Swimmers, my, my profile picture, the logo? Mm-hmm. I have. It's actually an upside down triangle, which is the universal symbol for water. And then it's three circles that are combined and the circles represent our community and our values and diversity. And so when you combine, you get, when you put them all together, you get the Afro Swimmers brand icon. And um, water is life. You can't get away from it. You can't survive without it. And it nourishes everything that we have. And without nourishment, you can't grow. And that goes for people too. How have you been tackling the hurdles or the resistance to teach African Americans to swim or to get into water? Mm. Well, the first thing I do is with the social media campaign, I promote, I'm telling the stories of not just myself as a swimmer and as a coach, but I'm telling the stories of other people who have experienced benefits and greatness and and transformation from swimming. And on the page, you'll see, sometimes I'll talk about a swimmer that I personally have worked with, or you'll see me sharing the story of another swimmer that I have met through hashtag Afro swimmers. What happens is people are convinced through testimony. You ever notice like um, as a woman, if you want to go get your hair, your nails done, you're, you're most likely, unless you're in an urgent situation, you're not just going to walk into a random hair salon and say, hey, I want to get my hair done. You, you're going to want a referral. You want to know somebody who's been there and said, girl, okay, let me tell you, this is my experience. She did a great job with this. Not so much with this. Yep. Make sure you ask her for this. And that makes you feel more confident about being there, right? Sure. So what Afro Swimmers is doing is we are creating the conversation. We've created the platform, the meeting place for people to come together and share their experiences about swimming, about their coaches, about what they loved, about what they didn't like. And they're connecting with other people who not only share those experiences, but they're telling their friends. Um, I would say that 60 percent of my clientele comes from my social media network. Hmm. Just people who have been looking at my pictures and like what I'm doing. And they're like, you know what? I have a six year old daughter. Um, I've always wanted to learn how to swim. I myself cannot swim. Can you please help me prepare her? Absolutely. Call me. Yeah. How did you start swimming? At so young an age, too. Uh, so I'm very grateful. My parents have instilled swimming in. I have a, I'm a middle child. I have an older sister and a little brother. All of us can swim. At a very early age, my parents took us to the YMCA. They were in the water with us. We were learning. Now, here's where I took swimming to a different level than my brother and sister initially. Um, I was always fascinated when the Olympics would come on. I would watch and watch and watch. And this is before we had all the fancy technology where we could now like go back and rewind it and pause it and clip, save clips of our favorite races. I had to watch everything in order to get to the part that I liked. And so I started duplicating what I saw on TV. Initially, I was self-taught when it came to stroke development. So I was watching them rotate, watching them breathe, watching how their hands cussed and they were pulling underneath the water. I was watching the, the, their shape of their legs when they were kicking. And I started duplicating it. That's and impressive. I would, every, Swimming is not intuitive. It's not. And you know what's funny is I never knew I was special until I became an adult. And I started running into so many people who couldn't do what I did. And swimming came so easy to me. I loved it. It made me so happy and I was so confident in what I was doing. And growing up, my mom couldn't afford a fancy coach to train me. So I had I had TV. I had the Olympics. And then when we started, when the, when it, the Internet started to become stronger and we started getting better signals, I was able to log on and start watching YouTube videos and channels. And I always just kept up with it. And so then when I became of age to get a job, I became a lifeguard. And I also became a WSI, a water safety instructor. And I started teaching water aerobics and working with people with uh, different types of ailments and disabilities and restrictions. Um, And I fell in love with that. And that's when I realized that my patients in the water was different from other people's patients in the water. I had some parents come up to me like, I have no idea how you do it, but I, I, I cannot teach her. I can swim, but my child won't listen. I cannot teach her. And then I would get the child and it's like a completely different person. 
And so they started, they started calling me the water whisperer. It was a joke. <laughs> but um, so I even taught swimming in college. Um, I went to Anderson University. Uh, upon graduating on a soccer scholarship and a vocal scholarship, that was funny. I didn't even know I could sing. That was hilarious. And no, <laughs> black people cannot sing. Just for our listeners, just shut that down right now. It's not true, okay? Because I got some family members that will prove it. It's not true. But I went to college and I, I sang at Anderson University and I also played soccer. And on the off season, you know what I was doing? Swimming. I was teaching swimming. On my off season. And don't ask me how I had time to do it. I had no idea, but I made time. And um, after an injury, I ended up transferring to Georgia Southern University where I graduated. And at Georgia Southern, I became a lifeguard. I started teaching. um, I, I became a group fitness instructor and I started teaching aqua aerobics. I was teaching students. I was teaching professors. I even taught special swim lessons for members of the ROTC so they could pass their swim test. No kidding. Mm -hmm. And this is at Georgia Southern. And at the time, I was a member of SGA. And Georgia Southern did not have a women's swim team. There was a lot of stuff going on with Title IX. And at the time, uh, they had other sports. They had had intramural swimming, but they did not have uh, a swim team uh, that you could compete on. And so... We, as a part of the SGA body, me and other students, of course, I was a part of the uh, panel that fought to get women swimming reinstated. And now they do have a swim team. And I myself will not benefit from that. But the, the girls that are there now who can swim if they want to, they now have that opportunity. It's so important for people to step up for others, you know, even if they won't benefit from themselves. Mm. Oh, that's a whole nother conversation. I was just talking to somebody about being selfless the other day. That's love. Yeah. When you truly love something, you know, I've, I've taught swimming for free and I still have people, somebody comes to me and they can't afford my rates, but I know that they, this is something that they need, that they really want. I make time for them and I do what I can because I love it that much. And I know that swimming is a life skill. I know how important it is and I know how it freed me from the frustration and the box that I was placed in. And I love to see other people win and experience that too. Are you still swimming? Yes. Yes, I am. In fact, I'll be coaching tonight. So last year I coached with a competitive team, the Metro Atlanta Aquatic Club, and it was an amazing experience. The head coach there, Mike Norman, is brilliant. And and, and it's one of the most diverse swim teams in Atlanta, which is why I went there. Uh, Growing up, it was very rare that you had a black swim coach. And it's even more rare that you have a black female swim coach. And so I worked with them and got to travel with them and watched him grow his program. And uh, he was an amazing resource and mentor for me. Competitive swimming, it's a year round activity. Every weekend you are at a meet, you're at swim practice at 530 in the morning. It's very exhausting um, for the everybody involved. But when you love it, you become a part of the grind. Um, But after a year, Coach Noel needed a break uh, because I wanted to pursue some other things with Afro swimmers. And so uh, I ended up coaching a non-competitive program in Smyrna. They actually did a half a million dollar renovation on their pool. And it's an amazing secret hidden gym. Like if you don't know where this place is, you would never know that there was a pool inside and a gorgeous one at that. And so I get to work with kids on technique development. I have a rule. If you can't do it slow, you can't do it fast. Sure. So a lot of these kids, they want to race. You know, they want to go so fast. You know, they want to get in and they're exhausting themselves. And I'm like, uh, 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 that's not how we do. We're going to start from the beginning. We're going to take it piece by piece. And we're, you're going to learn each part. And what's happening is I'm teaching self-awareness. Ultimately in swimming, you're not going to always have a perfect swim, but you're able to feel when something's not right. And then you can self-correct. And that's what I'm teaching my students. And so when they're learning how to race um, after they learn how to do the strokes. And so my program feeds competitive programs. Once I have a swimmer that has learned all of the skills and they're ready to go fast, I just send them on to a USA swimming team from my local swim council. Nice. You, you talked about teaching self-awareness. Can you teach that? I mean, can you teach body awareness? And I mean, I think about that a lot. I'm really curious how you teach that. There are several ways. So one of 
this is actually one of my favorite tools. I use tennis balls in the pool when I'm coaching. Now, yes, I use them to throw them at the kids when they're not listening. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. No, you're not. Like, Robert, get back on the ball. I know you heard me. No. Um, uh, so what I do is, uh, especially for my babies, I have them hold the tennis balls in their hands. And so what it does is it cusp their hand into a circular motion, almost like a little spoon. And then I have them close their fingers and open their fingers. The tennis ball allows them to feel their senses. They know that they're holding this ball. And if they don't hold their hand in the right way, it will fall. Then I have them, instead of focusing on moving their hands or reaching um, in a doggy paddle position, this is for my infants, I have them focus on the tennis ball. And what I do is I tell them, push the ball down to the bottom of the pool. And so what happens is they start moving their hands almost in a paddling motion. And it looks like they're dribbling. And in all actuality, they're moving their arms in the perfect paddling position to keep their faces above water. Once they get comfortable doing that, I remove the tennis ball. Did you come up with that yourself? That's, I did. A, that's amazing. And the fun part is that swimming, like there's so many amazing drills. Like there's a lot of accounts. Like one of my favorite accounts that I follow is a uh, go swim TV and they will feature a swimmer and a, and a drill every week. And, you know, they support Afro swimmers as well. And I really appreciate them. Shout out to Go Swim. Um, and uh, one of the things that I love as a coach is I get to be creative. When I see a student who's struggling with something, it's my job to find out co or come up with an alternative that allows them to learn. There is no you can't do it. It's just how what do I need to do to help you do it? You can do it. Right. There's nothing. There's no you know, there's no reason you can't do it. I just need to come up with the alternative, I need to come up with the accommodation that's going to work for you to get your attention. And so I use tennis balls. I use PVC pipes. Um, I use uh, duck floaties, anything I can get my hands on. And I can create a drill in a matter of minutes. It just depends on what your strength and your weakness is. Right. You sound incredibly busy. So what are your days like? <laughs> okay, so now we go into the story of the life of entrepreneurs. Uh, somebody posted something on Instagram the other day. They said uh, social media makes entrepreneurship look easy. And yeah, it does. It does. And they out here spread lies, okay? Lies. Um, being an entrepreneur has been one of the most liberating experiences of my entire life. And it has also been one of the most scary experiences of my life because the thing is, I live 24 hours at a time. Yes, I have plans. Uh, yes, I have goals. But anything could happen that could change each day. And I've experienced that. Um, also, I was not taught how to be an entrepreneur. I was taught how to work for somebody else. And when I got out of college, I did what was expected of me. I got a job. And unfortunately, I graduated during a time that our economy was at its worst. And that was when you had people with master's degrees and doctorates waiting tables because they couldn't find jobs in their fields and they weren't paying for their degrees. And it was a very difficult time. And I was very grateful to have found a job, uh, even though it was not in my field. But you know, over time, I started to digress. I started to realize it's like, I don't belong here. I'm, I'm not satisfied with this. I did not enjoy waking up or going to work. And I know most people don't. And I get that because we do what we have to do. You know, you have responsibilities. But there was something in me that kept saying I could have more if I wanted it. And I don't know why I felt this entitlement, but I did. And so uh, I remember one day I went to work and I left with a two weeks notice. I told them I I'll work here till this amount of time and I'm out. And I didn't have a reason. They didn't do anything wrong. It was me. I was uncomfortable. And I didn't even. And at the time, there was no Afro swimmers. There was no love swim coaching. I left without a plan with no so plan I left without a plan but I knew that God was going to make a way for me and that God was going to show me where I needed to be and I couldn't trust him doing that continuing to walk into this job every day knowing that it was literally dimming my light don't you feel like sometimes you have to open up the space for good stuff to come in absolutely all the time and and here's the thing I was scared I didn't know what I was going to do I had bills all I knew, there was something in me that said, this, do, do it. This is okay. 
And I had the strength to send that email. And I had the strength to pack my stuff up. And I had the strength to go to my car. And I had the strength to go to sleep that night. And what happened next was absolutely amazing. I, um, while I was trying to figure out what I wanted, I started teaching swim lessons because I knew I was good at that and I was at the pool anyway. And at first I was just working with one of my friend's daughters and then she told her friend and then her friend told her friends and then her friends told her friend's friends and then I had other kids from the neighborhood and next thing I knew I had an entire lessons business. And so I'm literally running my own business, swimming. And so um, then I started getting larger requests. Uh, A few weeks ago, I got a swim lesson request from Tanzania. Somebody reached out to me from in Tanzania and Africa and asked me for swim lessons, wanted to know my rates and when I was coming there. And they actually gave me the idea of going on a global tour. And I've been getting requests from cl- people outside of Atlanta, Georgia and other states saying, hey, you know, I live in New York. I live in L.A. Do you have any Afro swimmer coaches here? Well, here's wow. the thing. There's only one coach with the fro. I can't be duplicated. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, I'm realizing the importance of representation. It is so m- you have a right to learn from someone who looks like you. And it's not even so much as, oh, they're black. I'm black. We can connect. It's about being able to see yourself in the goal. And so I recently posted this article from Huffington Post talking about how every black girl should have representation in every sport and how it's important to be able to see yourself in that role. And uh, that's why Michelle Obama was so important. And all that's who I really voted for. I love Barack, but I voted for Michelle. <laughs> but no, just being able to see somebody in that position that looks like you it's enough to plant a seed and life and, and dreams and faith. They do the rest. I totally agree. I'm so glad you brought up that article um, in the Huffington Post. It's really terrific. It's by Janelle Harris. I'll link it on episode notes. But if you don't see yourself, you can't, you often can't imagine yourself in that spot. Not only can you not imagine it, especially when you've been generationally suppressed and oppressed, meaning you have been your family your ancestors, your history has been blocked out or withheld from you. You know, privilege is a very interesting concept that is happening. It's creating a global conversation, not just here in America, but I love meeting people from other countries who are having conversations about American culture and American society. And they're like, what's going on over here? I know you've got, you know, this orange guy and I know we're not supposed to like Trump, but what is the issue with the whites and blacks here? It's, it's, uh, it's, I don't know the exact answer to it because I've seen it cross. I've seen the barrier cross, meaning I've seen people overcome racial oppression. And I've also seen people become oppressed and depressed by racial ignorance. And ultimately what I like to look at is I try try to promote images and stories that get people to look past the color. Sometimes I'll even create the, one of the most recent pictures I posted. I took the color out the picture. I made it black and white and I did it intentionally because I wanted people to see it's the substance. It's the substance. Don't tell me that I can't do something because my skin is a different color. God is diversity. Swimming is diverse. We are all diverse. But uh, let's see if I can jump in. You asked me what was my day like when we talk about entrepreneurship. Yes. So as an entrepreneur, uh, now that I've found my passion, passions require what? Funding. <laughs> just because you find your dream and you find that thing that you're good at doesn't mean it's just going to fall out of the sky. and You're just going to be able to do it for free. That's not how it works. You still have to pay bills. You still have to network. You have to create the uh, opportunities that you need to take your passion to the next level. So um, I still work, you know, and I, and I grind and I take a lot of weird jobs. Uh, Well, uh, I'm a coordinator. And um, so I coordinate um, healthcare administration, which is kind of cool. That was a skill that I, I got years ago. 
And so I actually am a account coordinator uh, for a MRI imaging facility. Uh, I'm an aquatic coordinator. So I create aquatic programs. I create classes. Um, I train other coaches. Um, what else do I do? I have driven lift. Um, I have, uh, I've, I've house set, I've babysat. I mean, I've done whatever I had to do to invest in my business and to invest in my dream and continue to do so. Do you find that hard to do all those different jobs and sort of spread yourself all over the place? Yes. But what I've done is right now I've eliminated it to just one extra uh, activity. So right now I coordinate, uh, I still work in healthcare administration. Um, and then in the evenings, so I'll go to that job nine to five, sometimes earlier than that. And then I leave there and I go straight to the pool and I coach my non-competitive swim club. And then I teach one-on-one -on -one lessons all throughout the week. On Fridays, I only work in the mornings um, at my corporate office. And then in the evenings and, and, and from the afternoon to the evenings, all I do is coach. I take clients back to that. And on Saturdays, I rest. Saturdays are for me. Right. Um, Saturdays, I stretch. I'll do my yoga. I'll meditate. I'll read. I'll go for walks. Um, I meal prep. So every weekend, I go to the farmer's market, and I get everything that I need, and I prepare my food for the week. You don't. Oh, my God. You are my hero. Now you are my hero. <laughs> I've actually been thinking about sharing some of my pictures of what I cook and things on Afro Swimmer, so I'm going to start talking more oh, about Oh, you should, it definitely. In the future. Uh, but that was a game changer, too. Man, it is such a relief not to have to think about what you're going to eat. Really? I already thought of Yes. Tell but, me more. Okay, so, one, I'm always on the go, so I'm always hungry, and sometimes I forget to eat. If the food is not there and available and ready to go, I will just keep going. That's not healthy. It's not healthy. That's not okay. That doesn't make you tough. It doesn't mean you're on your grind. It makes you, for lack of, it makes you stupid. You need to take care of your body. And the only way for me to be the best at what I do is to get the proper nutrients and to make sure that I'm healthy. Also, if you don't know what you're going to eat, you have to think about it. And sometimes you'll compromise for unhealthy options because it's available, because it's convenient. You know, a lot of times, especially in black communities, they have fast food is everywhere. It's everywhere. And it is the absolute worst. And so um, last, I would say beginning of February is when I started meal prepping consistently because before I would do it kind of here and there. But now it's a weekly activity. Every week, I'm, they know me now at the farmer's market. They hi, Coach Noel. Hi, guys. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a regular and I try different fruits. And also it feels really good because I've, I've been able to cut back on my supplements because now I'm getting the nutrients that I need from my food. I mm -hmm. sleep better. My hair is growing. My nails grow. My skin is clear. Um, I'm very grateful. I did, I did not succumb to the cold epidemic that hit this season. It's, I, I've been really healthy. In fact, I feel the best that I've ever felt in a very long time. Okay. So what's your favorite meal that you prep on Saturday for the rest of the week? I always do fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. So I, I prepare a raw salad and I hook my salads up. I don't even like salad. Can I just say that? I don't like salad. I'm not a rabbit. I'm not one of those people that are like, oh, I just want a salad. No, I like things with parents. I like chicken and, <laughs> and <laughs> shrimp and fish. I am not vegan, but I do eat vegan things. I don't count calories either. I just give my body what it needs. Um, so every day I drink uh, kombucha, a uh, probiotic supplement drink. It's really good for your digestion. Uh, your immune system starts in your digestive system. A lot of people don't know that. Everything, st everything stems from the gut. If you have a healthy gut, you're going to have a healthy body. If you have an unhealthy gut, you're going to have an unhealthy immune system. So probiotics is essential. And kombucha, I use it just kind of as a cleanse. To keep, uh, to keep my gut healthy. So I drink that daily. I also drink ginseng. I prefer Korean ginseng. It's good for energy and another thing good for digestion. I hook these salads up, Elizabeth. We're talking about a uh, spring mix, 
and I, that means the darker the leaf, the better. Not not iceberg lettuce. Okay, we don't do iceberg. I don't even add romaine. Pure spring mix, arugula, uh, spinach. Um, then I add cilantro. I'll do, do green peppers, uh, fresh cucumbers, chia seeds, cranberries. Um, I'll add strawberries and blueberries, and then I'll do like a light balsamic vinaigrette or a light um, oil-based uh, Caesar dressing. It is so good. And so I've got, oh, and broccoli. I love to add fresh broccoli and peppers, sweet peppers. So these salads are colorful and it's fresh. It's not cooked. Then on top of that, I eat a portion of fresh fruit in addition to the fruit that's in my salad. So I normally do blackberries or blueberries for the antioxidants. Um, and those are, I consistently do those every week. And then each week I change my protein. So I might do chicken or I'll do salmon. Um, or I'll do a tuna steak. Um, or actually yesterday, this week, I didn't do a meat at all. Actually, I'm just having a fresh salad, fruit, and sweet potato. I was just craving sweet potato. Nice. So you cook the, the protein, you know, like on Saturday, and you just have it for the rest of the week. Uh-huh. And I put it in glass containers, and I, I have a glass container for each day. Nice. And I can just grab it. It is so easy. It's so easy. And it, it yes, it is a sacrifice on that Saturday, everybody's going out and they're like, oh, I'm going here. I'm going there. Where are you going? Farmer's market. But during the week when you're not eating right or you're too tired to make dinner, I'm already in the bed getting my eight plus hours of sleep. And I get eight hours of sleep, Elizabeth. Right. Right. No, that's right. I know that you have huge goals for Afro swimmers. So what are your goals? Mm. Well, the fun, the fun part uh, and one of the things that my mentor, one of my mentors um, always says to me is celebrate each step. The scariest part about being an entrepreneur and and taking on a dream is sometimes you'll set this really high goal. And instead of breaking it down into piece by piece so that you can actually achieve it, you get overwhelmed. Like, how am I going to do this? So one of the things that I force myself to do is I have to set small, weekly, realistic goals for myself. And one of my goals for 2018 was to get 2,000 followers and to get 3,000 posts on Afro Swimmers. And both came to pass in the month of February. And I made sure that I did special posts for those on Afro Swimmers. To some people, 2,000 followers is not that much. You know, it's like, well, big whoop, I have 6,000 or I have 30,000 or I have a million followers. Shout out to Will Smith. I love you. Um, <laughs> I'm so happy he's on Instagram. I love following his account. He is hilarious. Um, but for what I'm creating, I have a very active account. My followers are engaged with me. They comment. We talk. It's a community. So this is not just an account where people just come like a photo and leave. You're engaged. And I have a very high engagement rate for my page, uh, which has led to the success that I am seeing. Some of the goals are we're in the process of launching Afroswimmers.com. It's going to be a swim blog where I'm going to talk more about hair care, skin care, swimming, finding black coaches, the importance of black coaches. We're going to start writing our own articles. Um, also, uh, I've got some really cool partnerships that I'm creating this summer where we are possibly thinking of doing a swim camp nice. for certain communities. There's going to be an Afro swimmer uh, brand line. So we're going to be talking about T-shirts, towels, caps, suits, the whole nine. We're going for it. I'm not holding back. What about like skincare products and hair products and stuff like that? Oh my gosh, that is definitely uh, on the to-do list. Uh, the reason why I'm not going after that immediately is because I'm still learning about what products work and what do, and what products don't work. And I'm very public about talking about those. Um, but I also want to be careful because I don't know who I might end up becoming a brand ambassador for. Sure. So I'm trying. I, I tread softly when it comes to promoting hair care and skincare products. Now, what I do like to promote is the ingredients. I might not promote a particular brand and say, hey, this brand, you get it from here, it's $5, go get it. You're not going to hear me say that, especially about skincare or hair care. However, you will hear me talk about ingredients. So for example, I put oil on my face. I used to have, a lot of people don't know this about me, but I used to have severe acne. And now I am completely in love with my complexion, my skin. 
I hardly, I wear makeup for special events, but for my day to day, what you see is what you get. And I'm happy with that. I feel very beautiful. And growing up, I was always told not to put oil on my face because I had acne prone skin. And that couldn't have been more far from the truth. I moisturize and cleanse my face with a cleansing oil. Love it. And would never go back to anything else. Um, Coconut oil. There's a love hate relationship with coconut oil. A lot of people don't know this, but Coconut oil can actually dry out your hair. It has proteins in it, and some people have actually experienced breakage. I do not put coconut oil directly in my hair. I used to when I didn't know any better, but now I might use it if my hair is wet after a deep condition, but after that for day-to-day moisturization, no to the coconut oil. Coconut water is absolutely amazing for your skin. It's full of magnesium and potassium and all the electrolytes that you need. It's like nature's Gatorade without the artificial sugar, colors, um, and chemicals. So there's a lot of things that I promote as far as ingredients, but not necessarily a particular product. Because if you find a product that has those ingredients, use what works for you. Are you getting a good response from some of the bigger companies you talked about earlier that they haven't been responsive in the past to African-American swimmers? What what about now? And have you been talking to them? Yes, actually, yes, I have been talking to them. And yes, I am starting to see a response. Um, One of the my favorite pages, Speedo, has actually done a really good job of of upping the pictures with diversity and creating inclusion, especially in their marketing campaigns. You'll notice. a lot of times, have you seen these boards that people are, you can actually do yoga in the pool on, it's a fusion board and it floats and you have to balance it. And uh, I haven't had an opportunity to take a class, but there's a post on Speedo and they have a white woman, uh, an Asian woman and a black woman. And they're all lined up and they're on these boards. And I really appreciated that ad. Also, um, Finis has done a really good job of promote they they're they're really known for their tech suits them in arena they make really good tech suits and they've been doing a really good job of promoting just people of different colors and different complexions in their suits and so I am starting to see growth now there are some other accounts that I won't name that have not got they they haven't gotten the message and I have called them out and I am going to start calling them out more aggressively because it's unacceptable diversity has to be intentional You can't just put it out there on a whim, think the people will come. You need to represent everyone so that you can include everyone. Swimming is not just for you. It's for everyone, period. Right. And I I think sometimes people forget that it it does take a little extra effort sometimes to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. And it's worth it. It is so worth it. It's worth it physically. It's worth it spiritually. It's worth it emotionally. It's worth it financially. When you include the diversity of people of the world, you gain benefits of seeing life through so many different perspectives. And that's what it's all about. There's three sides to the truth. There's what I see, what you saw, and what actually happened. None of us are wrong. Nobody's wrong. It's just different. And I refuse to eliminate those differences because you don't look like me. That just doesn't make sense. Right. You were talking about entrepreneurship, and one of the things I wanted to ask you is, are you good at sort of managing responses that are both good and bad? Because, you know, Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs are always getting good and bad news. This is so true. Another thing that social media does not talk about. I have an example for you, and I'm really glad that you asked that question. It's a very good question. Constructive criticism is extremely important. Now, there's a difference between constructive criticism and criticism, but as an entrepreneur, you have to put yourself in a position to not take offense and always look for the lesson. That's one of the things that I tell myself, always look for the lesson. What am I, what are you supposed to see from this Noel? What are we learning today? That's what I, that's what I say. What are we learning today? I know what my intention is. I know the energy that I want to put out, but I don't always know what you're receiving. So it's important that I keep that door open so that I am open to feedback and concerns and questions But there's another part of that as well. In addition to being open to understanding other people's perspectives and how they see you, it is also important for me as a creator, because that's what I am. I am creating something. I'm living my passion. And in doing that, I also have to protect my own energy. Whenever I take on a client, 
you're not just coming to me for services and you're not just choosing me as a coach. I'm choosing you as a client. I don't have to work with everybody. And that's one of the things that I appreciate as an entrepreneur, as an owner, is I get to choose who I work with. When I go to my day-to-day nine-to-five, I don't get to choose who I work with. I represent the company that I work for. But when I have on that Afro swimmer shirt, when I'm in that swimsuit, when I'm in the pool, I represent Afro swimmers. I represent me. I represent the diversity that I am creating just by being there. And in doing so, there are some people that I don't work well with and that's okay. And I've learned to screen my clients and to, and to, and to trust my instincts and my intuition and my gut and say, you know, okay, this, I like your energy. I like where your head is. I believe that I can help you. But there are some people that I'm like, you know what? I don't think I'll be a good fit for you, but I don't just leave you hanging. I will help connect you to another coach or another system or facility that can accommodate your needs. Because ultimately I want you to learn how to swim. I just want you to learn how to swim in the best way. And you cannot properly learn from a coach that you don't trust, period. You can't do it. And a lot of parents have experienced a lot of issues with coaches or or, or, or companies where they have a different person coming in each week because they can't keep their staff uh, fully hired or the parent is trying to tell the coach how to coach their kid. And so the issue is if you're not going to trust me to build you as a swimmer, to give your, you or your child the skills that you need, I might not be the best person for you. I know my energy. I know my light. I know what I'm capable of. And I want to create magic. And I can't create magic if you're not willing. So there's some people that even though they, they sought me out as a coach and they're like, hey, I really want to learn from you after certain conversations and, and learning their energy, I've, I've had to decline. And I was like, you know, thank you so much for reaching out to me. But here's, the, here's my recommendations for you. And this is why. But I wish you the best. And if you have any questions or concerns, I'd be happy to assist any way I can. But I cannot coach you. Did it take you a long time to get to that point where you could, you were confident enough and sort of, you know, you were so true to yourself that you could make those decisions? Yes. Yes. It, it, it took me getting, getting hurt. Um, it took me getting frustrated in my own gift and not understanding why certain things didn't work out. And I realized, you know, we are, all, I'm not responsible for your energy but I am responsible for mine. I have no control over anyone else's behavior, but I do control how I react to it. And I believe that how you react to a situation determines the outcome. And I noticed that when I was dealing with clients who weren't willing or did, wouldn't, wouldn't trust me or our energies just didn't work well, it, it causes a frustration that doesn't just stay in the pool for me. I was taking it home. And that was something that I had to learn from just maturity and entrepreneurship one-on-one. What happens in the pool stays in the pool. And so as I'm learning about myself as a coach and as I'm learning about my strengths and my own weaknesses, I'm able to provide more and more services and more and more resources. So I wouldn't say that it took a long time, but I would say that I got to a point in my life where I started to accept the growth. And realize that God was showing me something about myself. And it's okay to learn because this is my journey. More importantly than it, for anyone else, this is my journey. And I am responsible for my own life. And I want to preserve it. And I want to bring people joy. And if I feel like I can't do that, I'm going to send you to someone who can give it to you. That's fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have anything else you'd like to offer before we sign off or anything that you want to say to the listeners? I do. Um, I just want to encourage, if I, if I may, I just want to encourage all the young people out there. If you feel out of place, you feel like you're going to work and you're, you're pushing and you're fighting to, you know, make ends meet, but you don't feel like you're creating a legacy. You're not producing anything from it. I want to challenge everybody to ask yourself, what do you want? And what do you have that you think the world wants? And for me, it was swimming. It was it was being confident in who I am. And the more confident I become, the more people I'm able to bless. And the funny thing is that didn't require money or a special scholarship. It just took faith. And so 
I want everyone to know that regardless of the cards you were dealt, regardless of where you're from or what you were born into, you have a God-given right to be happy and you can create the happiness and the joy that you want one day at a time. Swimming is a life skill. If you've ever had difficulty learning or you've never felt comfortable, I want to encourage you to reach out uh, to your local swim community, your local pool, or you can reach out to Afro Swimmers. Uh, follow me at Afro Swimmers on Instagram. We're also on Facebook. Uh, you can DM me. I do respond to those messages and I will support you in any way that I can. And the more people that learn how to swim, the more people we can save. And I'm here for it. So swim more, everyone. You are the best. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome, Elizabeth. I'm so proud of you. And I appreciate you for creating this platform where women can share and be honest about how they're building these these, these mega powerful movements. And uh, I will definitely be listening and following and I'll support uh, her sports all the way. Well, I'm grateful for you being on the show, and I look forward to talking to you again sometime. Yes, yes, and yes, to the future. Yes, awesome. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please spread the word about this podcast, about the phenomenal female athletes highlighted here, and about women who show us our goals are possible. Sign up for the newsletter and get a link to the Spotify playlist with favorite workout songs from many of my guests. Every other week, I send out a brief email with highlights from the recent episode, plus a couple of links to videos and articles that struck me as fun. Follow Hear Her Sports on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Hear Her Sports. Or let me know what you think by emailing elizabeth at hearhersports.com. And I'll be back in two weeks with another episode. So see you then. Bye-bye.